All right, so Donald Trump speaks for the first time on the assassination attempt at the Republican National Convention. And this is worth watching because you get to judge what you hear from him. I'm going to tell you what I hear from him, especially from a mental health perspective. And the key points to see from this, because this isn't about politics, this is about people. This is about understanding that someone actually tried to take him out. And he was front and center for that. And he experienced it. And he's going to give us his account of what happened. And this is just phenomenal to listen to. Uh, so without further ado. All right, Donald Trump. Let me begin this evening by expressing my gratitude to the American people for your outpouring of love and support following the assassination attempt at my rally on Saturday. As you already know, the assassin's bullet came within a quarter of an inch of taking my life. So many people have asked me, what happened? Tell us what happened, please. Before this goes any further, I want everybody who watches this to understand that it doesn't matter whose life was attempted to be taken. It doesn't matter. This is wrong. This is bad. This is terrible to imagine. And I think everybody on every side of every angle in America that is sane will understand and agree that this shouldn't happen. This cannot be a part of our society or then everybody takes matters into their own hands. And regardless of what is said, he's already got the demeanor of being settled, regardless of what is said about this man and who he is and what you think he's like and all of that. I challenge anybody to be put up on a stage like that in front of all those people just talking and all of a sudden you see a bullet come right by your face and hit you. And the reality of trauma, the reality of PTSD, the reality of fear that kicks in is I've got to be beyond any other. I've never been shot at. I don't know what that feels like, but I do know one thing. It will change your life inside yourself forever. And I pray, I pray that everyone watching this and everyone around can understand that this is human life we're talking about. And people want to know. People want to hear the story. And therefore, I will tell you exactly what happened. And you'll never hear it from me a second time because it's actually too painful to tell. Mm. It was a warm, beautiful day in the early evening in Butler Township in the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Mm. Music was loudly playing and the campaign was doing really well. I went to the stage and the crowd was cheering wildly. Everybody was happy. I began speaking very strongly, powerfully, and happily <laughs> because I was discussing the great job my administration did on immigration at the southern border. We were very proud of it. <laughs> Behind me and to the right was a large screen that was displaying a chart of border crossings under my leadership. The numbers were absolutely amazing. In order to see the chart, I started to, like this, turn to my right and was ready to begin a little bit further turn, which I'm very lucky I didn't do when I heard a loud whizzing sound and felt something hit me really, really hard on my right ear. I said to myself, wow, what was that? It can only be a bullet. And moved my right hand to my ear, brought it down. My hand was covered with blood, just absolutely blood all over the place. 
I immediately knew it was very serious that we were under attack and in one movement proceeded to drop to the ground. Bullets were continuing to fly as very brave Secret Service agents rushed to the stage, and they really did, they rushed to the stage. So what's phenomenal about Secret Service agents, period, is their job is to protect the president in this regard, uh, to protect him, and they risk their life. They cover his body and shield anything that comes. If a bullet gets hit, or gets sent his direction, they shield it, just like what happened when Ronald Reagan was shot at and hit um, back in 19, early 80s, that their job is to protect. There's, there's no other. It is to be that protective shield for him. I can, you know, when you hear this story and you hear him telling it just piece by piece, I can understand why he would say, you'll never hear me say this story again. It's too painful. Therapy is needed for this. He will probably never, ever get therapy. I understand that. EMDR is needed for this in terms of treatment to be able to desensitize the brain to what happened. It can be a super successful thing to do to help him experience relief from the trauma. This is, no matter who you are, one of the scariest things I think anybody can ever go through. And I've heard from so many people who have had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, triggers from all over the place that weren't even there. People that have called me, people that have messaged me, people that I've talked to who said just watching it scared me to death. And just watching it makes me want to turn it off because it's too painful to watch. And when you realize this is another human, that's the key. I don't care who it was that was on that stage, did not deserve to get shot at. And the fear that those bullets are coming and they are coming from all directions can create so much trauma inside your brain that you will always walk around fearing like you are under attack. Now, the Secret Service were a great security for him and I think gave him security. But once he hit the ground... Everybody in the audience didn't know, right? They don't know what's going on because it's happening in real time. These are great people at great risk, I will tell you, and pounced on top of me so that I would be protected. There was blood pouring everywhere, and yet, in a certain way, I felt very safe because I had God on my side. I felt that. The amazing thing is that prior to the shot, if I had not moved my head at that yep. very last instant, the assassin's bullet would have perfectly hit its mark. And I would not be here tonight. We mm. would not be together. The most incredible aspect of what took place on that terrible evening in the fading sun was actually seen later. In almost all cases, as you probably know, and when even a single bullet is fired, just a single bullet, and we had many bullets that were being fired, Crowds run for the exits or stampede, but not in this case. It's very unusual. This massive crowd of tens of thousands of people stood by and didn't move an inch. In fact, many of them bravely but automatically stood up looking for where the sniper would be. They knew immediately it was a sniper and then began pointing at him. You can see that if you look at the group behind me. That was just a small group compared to what was in front. Nobody ran and by... You know, as I said before in previous videos, that when trauma kicks in, there is fight, flight, or freeze that can happen. You know, Trump's response typically is going to be fight. He, that's who he is. That's his personality. So he is going to be one to go towards the danger, towards the thing that's attacked him. Other people will escape and run like he's talking about and just get out of there because I'm scared to death and I want to leave. 
And then it's almost like the audience had a freeze response, which was, I don't know what to do here. What's happened? And everybody's trying to catch themselves, almost like you, you're, you can't take action. And they're wondering what happened to him. And they don't know what happened to him. And they don't want to leave and just run away. But they don't know where to go because they're stuck there. Just the feeling in that crowd, I wonder what it was that day because it's mentally got to scare you to death. What's coming next? Are there more bullets coming next? Or um, is this going to be a date that changes history forever in a really horrible way? Not stampeding. Many lives were saved. But that isn't the reason that they didn't move. The reason is that they knew I was in very serious trouble. They saw it. They saw me go down. They saw the blood and thought, actually most did, that I was dead. They knew it was a shot to the head. They saw the blood. And there's an interesting statistic. The ears are the bloodiest part. If something happens with the ears, they bleed more than any other part of the body. For whatever reason, the doctors told me that. I said, why is there so much blood? He said, it's the ears. They bleed more. So we learned something, but they just... <laughs> they just, this beautiful crowd, they didn't want to leave me. They knew I was in trouble. They didn't want to leave me. And you can see that love written all over their faces. Too. Incredible people. They're incredible people. Bullets were flying over us, yet I felt serene. But now the Secret Service agents were putting themselves in peril. They were in very dangerous territory. Bullets were flying right over them, missing them by a very small amount of inches. And then it all stopped. Mm. Our Secret Service sniper from a much greater distance and with only one bullet used, took the assassin's life, took him out. I'm not supposed to be here tonight. Not supposed to be here. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you. But I'm not. <laughs> and I'll tell you. That's really a big thing. You know, everybody who knows me knows about my faith. And I do believe that God it can put us, God can put us wherever he will put us, wherever we need to be. And no matter how much someone wanted to attack him that day, that it was almost impossible for him to survive that. It was almost impossible for him to turn his head at that exact moment, if you see the video that been, has been recreated. And let's remember something. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback. It's easy to backseat drive. It's easy to have hindsight in 2020. It, you know, it's just that it's perfect vision when we look after the fact. Most of us saw this after it already happened. So we knew he was okay. We knew everything worked out fine. And so we can, we can question and we can judge. This is not something to judge. This is something to really pay attention to. I deal with trauma every single day with people. And I've seen people with their lives being attempted to be taken. A gunpoint, gun to their head, ready to kill them. And it not happen. And the reality is the people who are experiencing it that day and Donald Trump experiencing it that day, it was very real in real time. It felt like no other event, and I believe what he's saying. He believes I wasn't supposed to be here today. There, there is no logical, statistical reason I should be here today because that bullet should have killed me. Except for an instant twitch, turn of the head, that allowed it to skate by. It's a miracle. It's statistically impossible to me to have that happen. And I want people to understand when you leave comments and you judge and you make light of this situation, that these are real people and they experience a real situation with a real fear that they will die. 
I stand before you in this arena only by the grace of Almighty God. In watching the reports over the last few days, many people say it was a providential moment. Probably was. When I rose, surrounded by Secret Service, the crowd was confused because they thought I was dead, and there was great, great sorrow. I could see that on their faces as I looked out. They didn't know I was looking out. They thought it was over. But I could see it. I wanted to do something to let them know I was okay. I raised my right arm, looked at the thousands and thousands of people that were breathlessly waiting, and started shouting, fight, fight, fight. Instinct. Thank you. Once my and I've said it before, I believe that shout is reactive for him. I believe it's part of his fight or flight reaction, which is fight. And he literally said the word. And I think it's to show as a leader. I think any great team has to have a coach that does this or a player. You can have a player that's injured on the field, your best player, your leader. And when they get up from an injury and they recover and they stand up and they say, I'm okay, I will make it. It gives the team hope. And I think that's what he was doing was do not let them take you down. Do not let this dampen your spirits. Do not let them know that they can take you out like this, that we will fight to stay alive and we will fight to survive. I clenched, fist went up, and it was high into the air. You've all seen that. The crowd realized I was okay and roared with pride for our country like no crowd I have ever heard before. Never heard anything like it. For the rest of my life, I will be grateful for the love shown by that giant audience of patriots that stood bravely on that fateful evening in Pennsylvania. Tragically, the shooter claimed the life of one of our fellow Americans, Corey mm -hmm. Comparator. Unbelievable person, everybody tells me. Unbelievable. We need to remember that. You know, there's somebody who came, two people injured, one people that died, came to this event to experience a rally, to cheer, to be a part of something. And him coming with his children, his wife. And then this happens, that real people die, which affects real lives, changes everything. And seriously wounded, two other great warriors Spoke to them today, David Dutch and James Copenhaver, two great people. I also spoke to all three families of these tremendous people. Our love and prayers are with them and always will be. We're never going to forget them. They came for a great rally. Mm -hmm. They were serious Trumpsters, I want to tell you. They were serious Trumpsters and still are. But Corey, unfortunately, we have to use the past tense. He was incredible. He, he was a highly respected former fire chief, respected by everybody. Was accompanied by his wife, Helen, incredible woman I spoke to her today, devastated, and two precious daughters. He lost his life selflessly acting as a human shield to protect them from flying bullets. He went right over the top of them and was hit. What a fine man he was. So sad on top of all of that, that 
a firefighter, fire chief, giving his life to service and saving other people's lives. His actual uniform there with his helmet. And man, what a gesture to be able to go over and give. I mean, it, it, it rips me apart to think that people, good people, a family person, a father, a husband has to die because of someone's feelings towards this man. It's just, it makes no sense to me. It's crazy thinking. Anybody who thinks they missed, darn, oh well, that is insanity. It's not normal. It's not healthy. It's not productive. It's not good for anything. And it's sure not a joke. My wife always says there's a lot of truth in jest. Anytime you're joking and jesting, there's a lot of truth in that. And if that's who you are as a person, I am saddened for you. I'm very sad because this is a person who now doesn't get to raise his daughters. He doesn't get to go to their wedding. He doesn't get to be with his wife the rest of his life. Why? Because he went to a rally. And because somebody who was crazy came and decided he wanted to do something because he felt like he could. And whatever's behind all of this, I really believe in this moment, Donald Trump recognizes that this man died because I was there speaking. And that sits inside you. If I wasn't at that event or if that didn't happen that day, he wouldn't have been there. And that's that survivor's guilt thing that kicks in where you feel responsible because someone was hurt or injured or wounded or killed in this case because I was a part of that. And that's what's so sad. It's not his fault at all. But you can feel a lot of survivor's guilt from that. And boy, would I love to talk to somebody who was at this rally and just feel the vibe of what goes on as the moments tick by. I want to thank the fire department and the family for sending his helmet, his outfit, and uh, it was just something, and they're going to do something very special when they get it, but we did something which cannot match what happened, not even close. But I am very proud to say that over the past few days, we've raised $6.3 million. Wow. For the families of David, James, and Corey, including from a friend of mine, just called up, he sent me a check right here, I just got it. One million dollars. <laughs> from Dan Newland, thank you, Dan. That's over seven million dollars in a week. That was, and aside from any feelings anybody has, you have to be grateful and appreciate that people can pull together enough to say, we want to support these people through their pain, through their recovery, and also through their grief, the rest of their life that Corey's family has to survive without him. That it's so amazing. This is amazing to me to pull together and find millions of dollars so that they can be comfortable and that they don't have to worry. And again, when speaking to the family, I told them, I said, well, I'm going to be sending you a lot of money, but it can't compensate. Mm -hmm. They all said the same thing. You're right, sir. We appreciate so much what you're doing, but nothing can take the place in the case of Corey and the other two. By the way, they were very, very seriously injured, but now they're doing very well. They're going to be okay. They're going to be doing very well. They're warriors. So now I ask that we observe a moment of silence in honor of our friend, Corey. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for others. This is the spirit that forged America in her darkest hours, and this is the love that will lead America back to the summit of human achievement and greatness. This is what we need. 
Despite such a heinous attack, we unite this evening more determined than ever. I am more determined than ever, and so are you. So is everybody in this room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donald Trump speaks at his acceptance speech, Republican National Convention. And what a sobering set of time there. What a sobering moment to just realize, you know what? There are more important things, y'all. Please, please hear this as a mental health professional. There are more important things than what's on social media, than who wins an election, than uh, what you have versus what somebody else has. There's life. There's family, there's relationships, and it can all be taken away in an instant, as we saw here, from people who weren't even a party to any of what was going on. And it makes all of us question, it makes all of us doubt at times, are we safe? Is it going to be okay? And that's what he was trying to say here. And what a what a cool story of Corey shielding his family and trying to keep them from getting hit and being willing to lose his life so that they didn't have to. What a story. Um, so many messages in this. Leave your comments. Let me know what you think. Mental health matters. If you're struggling or somebody you know, please get help. We have links in the description, but you deserve the help. It is way better than going down this road that this shooter ended up in and that a lot of people end up in. Please, please recognize these are people and don't start making comments about what you wish would have happened, uh, that you wish any of this would have. I just, please, just stay away. And... Go live your life by yourself if you need to do that. But it's not okay to start ripping anybody apart. Anybody who knows me knows that's how I believe. Mental Health Matters. We'll see you on the next Reaction Therapy.